Good afternoon and welcome to uh, today's CLEAR webinar, Landsat Unveiled, uh, getting started using Landsat data in ArcGIS. Um, with us today, we have two of our CLEAR colleagues, James Hurd and Dan Sivko. James is with me here uh, in our office in Haddam, and Dan is joining us from his office in stores. And before I turn it over to James and Dan, uh, I just got to do the usual particulars um, about the webinar series here. Uh, this is the seventh presentation in the 2015 uh, CLEAR webinar series. As you can see, we have a bunch of webinars that are already archived on our website that you can go back and watch at any time at clear.ucon.edu. Today, of course, is Landsat Unveiled, getting started with Landsat data. And then we do have one coming up on uh, roadside vegetation management, which our uh, extension forester, Tom Worthley, is going to be uh, presenting in a few weeks. And you can find details on registering for that on our website. Finally, for those of you who aren't familiar with CLEAR, uh, CLEAR is a center here at the University of Connecticut um, that is part of the College of Ag, Health, and Natural Resources, the Departments of Extension, uh, the Department of Natural Resources, and uh, Sea Grant. And we have a bunch of outreach and research programs that are all focused on the uh, areas of land use and climate resilience. Uh, water quality and geospatial technology, and we sort of try to bring all of those together to be support for communities to help them uh, in land use planning and natural resource protection. So that's it for the opening uh, remarks, and now I will turn it over to James to get us started with today's presentation. Thanks, Dave. As you said, today's webinar will be Landsat Unveiled getting started using Landsat data in ArcGIS. I am James Hurd, and Dan Sivko is joining us. Can you hear us, Dan? I can hear you. Hope everybody can hear me. I'm going to be muted through much, much of this unless there's questions coming up. OK, great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I want to acknowledge that this webinar is sponsored by Connecticut View and CLEAR, the Center for Land Use Education and Research. So Connecticut View is one of about 41 state views who are part of the America View Consortium. America View is a nationwide program funded through the USGS with the primary purpose of promoting and educating the public about the use of remote sensing technology. And of course, CLEAR um, was established in 2002 and we're here to um, provide information and assistance to land use decision makers and other audiences in support of better land use decisions, healthier natural resources, and more resilient communities. So our goal for today's webinar is to provide information about the Landsat series of remote sensing satellites. What is Landsat all about? How can it be used? Where can you get it? And how can you start to use it in an ArcGIS environment? So the basic outline for the webinar will be a brief overview of the remote sensing process. We will show a few examples of the application of Landsat imagery. We will describe the Landsat sensors and characteristics. We will identify some online resources that provide more in-depth information about Landsat. We will show you where and how to download Landsat data. And we will show you how to get Landsat data into ArcGIS so you can start using it. So let's get started. First, I want to do a quick little poll. Um, I want to know, have you ever used Landsat data? So you can answer yes, no, or not that I know of. And it looks like about 49% of the people uh, logged on right now have used Landsat. About 28% have not, and 23% uh, have do not know if they've used this before or not. So that's good. So some of you hopefully will get a little review of what Landsat is all about and maybe how to use it in ArcGIS. And it's going to be new to a, a lot of you, which is good. So think about remote sensing for a second. The value of remote sensing is that it provides us with a synoptic view of the world, including spatial relationships between features and temporal changes and trends that allow us to monitor and analyze natural and human-induced phenomena. He had to hit one more button that was like high. For a definition of remote sensing, we will use this. Remote sensing is the art and science involving the detection, identification, classification, delineation, and analysis of Earth's surface features and phenomena using imagery acquired from terrestrial aircraft and satellite platforms that are, are equipped with photographic and non-photographic sensors using visual and computer-assisted interpretation techniques. 
The basic re process of remote sensing is shown in this graphic. There is an energy source, typically the sun. The energy passes through the atmosphere and travels to the Earth's surface where it is reflected off, absorbed by, or transmitted through features on the Earth's surface. Reflected and emitted think thermal energy is collected by a sensor to create an image. When we view an image, we can see how the features reflect energy in different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. For example, clear water is very slightly reflective, but only in the visible wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. Water absorbs longer wavelengths of energy. Vegetation and soil are slightly more reflective in the visible wavelength, but vegetation is also highly reflective in the near-infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Why is this? Primarily due to the cell structure of the plant leaf. Soil reflectance is largely due not only to the color of the soil, but also particle size and moisture content. Viewing both the true color composite image on the left and a near-infrared composite to the right in these high spatial resolution images, you can see how the vegetation is morely, more highly reflective in the near-infrared than some of the other non-vegetative features. Also in the span combination, water appears dark because it is absorbing much of the energy. Further out on the spectrum, you can see how a ground surface emits more energy in the form of heat than water. Looking at the thermal image, you can see the distinction between water, the dark features, and land, the brighter features. The message here is that features on the Earth's surface will interact differently with electromagnetic energy, and as such, by capturing images from various regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, we are able to better distinguish and identify these features and also identify the vigor and health of the landscape. The more spectral information available to us in an image, the better we are able to distinguish features. Next, I would like to provide a few examples of how Landsat imagery is being used. But first, to set the stage, I want to show this brief video that overviews the Landsat program. The video was produced by NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. There is music to the soundtrack, but I'm not sure if you will be able to hear it, so, but it's a short video, so we'll give it a try. see, the uses of Landsat image data are substantial. As such, I want to provide a few more applications of Landsat. One of the primary uses of Landsat is to compare images from different times to identify change. Thinking about the complexities of urbanization, the lights, activities, complex social interactions, multifaceted cultures, it is no wonder the urban landscape is growing faster than rural areas. In 2008, Earth experienced a milestone in terms of global population in that more than 50% of the human population now lives in areas of contiguous urban development. We can certainly relate to that here in Connecticut. With growing population comes changes to the land surface, vegetation, water cycle, radiant heat, and other aspects of human existence. Using Landsat imagery, we can better monitor change and also forecast patterns of change in urban landscapes. In this example of Denver, Colorado, we can see the expansion of the built-up area as shades of purples and blues, including the airport over a 27-year period. 
Another change example is looking at forest disturbance. Forest disturbances are events that cause change in the structure and composition of a forest ecosystem beyond just the growth and depth of individual trees. Disturbances can vary in frequency and intensity and include natural disasters such as fire, landslides, and wind, and outbreaks of insects, fungi, and other pathogens, and human-caused disturbances such as logging, pollution, the clearing of land for urbanization or agriculture, and the introduction of invasive species. Here is an example of the U.S. Forest Service using the archive of Landsat imagery to identify areas and types of disturbance in the forest over time. Flooding is certainly a common occurrence around the world, and being able to identify the extent of flooding is beneficial in terms of disaster response and restoration. In this example, you can see the normal course of the Wabash River between Illinois and Indiana on the left in the June 9, 2007 Landsat image versus the extent of flooding following an extremely heavy rain event in early June of 2008. With increasing population pressures throughout the world, there is a need for increased agricultural production and improved management. Landsat data is one of the tools which allows us to better understand our agricultural practices. We can analyze things such as the health and vigor of crops as they mature over the growing season, the needs of specific fields for fertilizer, irrigation requirements, crop rotation, acreage amounts for forecasting crop production, and fighting crop insurance fraud. The example on the left shows the result of applying the water deficit index model on a Landsat image in 1994 for an agricultural area in Arizona. The green areas are being irrigated at the time of this image capture. Yellow indicates drier vegetated areas and red are dry fallow fields. Indices like the water deficit index help us understand soil moisture conditions allowing us to better manage water use in agriculture. On the right are three examples of processing Landsat data to derive measures of vegetation density at the top and water deficit in the center to generate a crop stress map at the bottom. Monitoring cultural change, especially around urbanized areas, is critical for protecting life and property. In this example, the World Bank has been using historical Landsat and other data to monitor change in the coastline identifying areas of erosion and accretion, and tracking the change in the shoreline. A rather unique use of Landsat is for bathymetry purposes. Typically, remote sensing the near coast ocean floor is difficult, primarily the result of sediment in the water column. As such, the results do not meet hydrographic accuracy standards. But should the water be clear and the seafloor bottom is bright, such as with sand, then estimates of depth can be measured. Different wavelengths of energy penetrate water to differing degrees. The smaller wavelengths, the blue and green, penetrate water better than longer wavelengths, near-infrared, shortwave infrared. By modeling the depth of energy penetration based on the amount of reflectance measured by the Landsat sensor, we can estimate water depth. Estimated water depth can be compared with nautical charts to identify potential areas that need to be recharted. In this case, red indicates shallow water. The water depth model indicates that the shoaling of Brown's Bank has shifted since the chart's initial creation, flagging the area as a location in need of a new bathymetric survey. Sometimes the images can just be beautiful to look at, such as with this May 12, 2013 Landsat view from Western Australia, where the water and land features were masked, separately enhanced, and then reassembled using different band combinations to create this picture. So we just saw a few examples of applications of Landsat imagery, but who are the users of Landsat? In a report published by the USGS in 2011, they found based on a survey of over 2,500 respondents taken during 2009 and 2010, that Landsat is used largely by the academic sector but also federal and state governments and private businesses. Landsat is almost universally preferred over other forms of moderate resolution imagery as identified in the table. This is likely the result of it being readily available at no charge for the consistent temporal coverage and the long historical archive of available imagery provided by Landsat. 
The report also found that Landsat is used for a wide variety of applications across all the user sectors, with environmental science applications being the more popular use of the data. Planning and development is also identified as a widely used application of Landsat imagery in the local government sector. Um, we do have a question. Are the shortwave bands available for every Landsat mission? Or are there hyperspectral bands only available in the latter missions? Um, typically, the, the shortwave infrared bands will be available um, starting with Landsat 4 with the thematic mapper sensor on board. Uh, the previous Landsats before that time only had visible and near infrared uh, wavelengths available. So really starting around 1982, those shortwave infrared bands uh, will be available and they're currently available on those satellites now flying. So another report produced by the Office of Science and Technology Policy, part of the Executive Office of the President, had 300 federal subject matter experts assess 362 observation systems as to the level of impact with respect to 13 societal themes. Out of the 362 observation systems, Landsat ranked number three in terms of its importance uh, across these societal themes. It trailed only NEXAD radar, weather radar at number two, and the global positioning uh, GPS at number one. Um, I hope these uh, reports shed a little light on the societal importance of the Landsat missions and the benefits of having access to this data. Next, I want to take a closer look at Landsat, its sensors and characteristics. Landsat is a series of satellites first launched in 1972 and represents the world's longest continuously acquired collection of spaceborne moderate resolution land and remote sensing data. The Landsat mission continues to provide global coverage of the Earth's surface today. Landsats 1 through 5 carry the multispectral scanner, which had four spectral bands at 80 meter spatial resolution. Landsat 4 and 5, in addition to the MSS, also carried the thematic mapper, which had six reflective bands at 30 meters spatial resolution and a thermal band at 120 meters spatial resolution. Landsat 6, launched in 1993, carried the enhanced thematic mapper plus sensor, but failed to reach orbit and now rests at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. Landsat 7, launched in 1999, also carries the enhanced thematic mapper plus sensor which includes a 15 meter spatial uh, panchromatic band and reduces the spatial resolution of the thermal band to 60 meters. The most recent satellite, Landsat 8, was launched in 2013. It carries the operational land imager, which collects eight spectral bands at 30 meters, plus a 15 meter panchromatic band, and the thermal infrared sensor has two thermal bands at 100 meter spatial resolution. Landsat 9, is already being planned and is scheduled for launch in 2023, but the hope is to move that date forward to at least 2021. Looking more closely at each of the four Landsat sensors, this graph identifies the location of the multispectral scanner bands aboard Landsat 1 through 5 against an atmospheric transmission graph where the gray areas represent those parts of the atmosphere that allow for the transmission of energy. Sensors are designed to capture information in certain parts of the spectrum based on the physical characteristics of energy transformation uh, in the atmosphere. The MSS bands cover the green, red, and near infrared portions of the electromagnetic spectrum and are delivered at a resampled spatial resolution of 60 meters. Adding the thematic mapper sensor bands aboard Landsats 4 and 5, you can see the slightly more narrow bandwidth and the inclusion of the blue band and two shortwave infrared bands, all at 30 meters spatial resolution, in addition to the thermal band, which has a spatial resolution of 120 meters. All bands here are delivered at 30 meters spatial resolution. The enhanced thematic mapper plus sensor on board Landsat 7 is essentially the same as the thematic mapper, although the thermal band was collected at 60 meter resolution plus the addition of the 15 meter panchromatic band that covers the green, red, and near infrared wavelengths. All bands are delivered at 30 meter spatial resolution 
plus the 15 meter panchromatic band. The operational land imager and thermal infrared sensor on board Landsat 8 further improves on band coverage with the addition of the coastal band and the cirrus band. It also provides two thermal bands collected at 100 meter resolution. The coastal band allows for improved penetration of coastal waters and for studies of atmospheric aerosols. The cirrus band was added to more easily identify high altitude clouds that could impact analysis of the imagery. All bands are delivered at 30 meter spatial resolution plus the 15 meter panchromatic band. So the spatial resolution of Landsat ranges from 60 meter resample with the MSS sensor to 30 meter spatial resolution with the TM, ETM, and OLI images. And of course the 15 meter panchromatic band available on the ETM and the OLI sensors. At 30 meter spatial resolution, it gives us a pretty good spatial representation of the Earth's surface. Landsat has a 16 day revisit period, meaning it flies over a location every 16 days. It is, however, the combination of spatial resolution and spectral resolution that makes the Landsat image an ideal choice for many scientific studies and monitoring projects. To get some perspective, comparing spatial resolution against the spatial extent of a football field, you can see that a single Landsat MSS pixel encompasses almost the entire field. It would take about three Landsat enhanced thematic mapper pixels to cover the field. As such, you would likely not be able to easily see a football field in a Landsat image, such as this example of Rockville High School in Vernon. The red ellipse shows you where the location of their football field actually is. So here's a comparison of near-infrared color composite Landsat imagery with higher spatial resolution aerial imagery of the Yukon campus. No, you do not get the spatial detail being able to see every house in Landsat, but it's generally good enough for monitoring change in the landscape. Looking at spectral resolution, using the Landsat 8 as an example, here are some examples of six of the eight reflective bands available. Here's the, red, the blue band, the green band, the red band, all provide a somewhat similar reflectance and hence are somewhat correlated. The near-infrared band looks very different due to the high reflectance of vegetation in the near-infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum and the two middle infrared bands. Looking at the three visible wavelength bands together, blue, green, and red, provide a natural color composite where features look as they would to our unaided eye. In this case, vegetation appears green. Viewing the near infrared, green, and red bands together provides a color infrared composite. Healthy green vegetation will appear red in this band combination because vegetation is highly reflective in the near infrared wavelength. And viewing the near infrared and both middle infrared bands together provide a reflective infrared composite where vegetation is red, water bodies are black, and non-vegetative surfaces are shades of cyan and blue. Here is a rather poor example of the coastal band on Landsat 8 showing the outflow of the Connecticut River into Long Island Sound. Again, the coastal band is typically used to analyze coastal water and aerosols in the atmosphere. In the cirrus band on the right, where the clouds become more apparent than can be seen in the natural color image on the left. Using the cirrus band, we can use it to analyze more closely the Landsat 8 image to identify if there is a lot of atmospheric interference um, within the image. The thermal infrared band, which can be found on Landsat's 4 through 8 platforms, measure emitted land surface temperature. In a thermal band, the darker shades represent cooler areas in relation to the brighter areas, which represent regions emitting more energy in the form of heat. These thermal bands are particularly important when investigating irrigation practice use in arid land, as well as heat units in urban areas. 
This example shows an active volcano where you can easily see the heat signature in the caldera. There have been issues with the Landsat 8 thermal bands where energy from outside the normal field of view or stray light has affected the data collections, resulting in slightly higher reported temperatures. While usable in normal monitoring activities, it is recommended the thermal bands not be used for scientific studies at this time. Looking at the Landsat scene footprint, a single Landsat scene is slightly larger than Connecticut and is approximately 183 kilometers wide by 170 kilometers high. Having a large footprint tends to make data collection and use much easier than using multiple tiles of imagery collected at various dates at a higher spatial resolution. Here you can see all of the orbital paths flown by the Landsat sensor. Landsat is in a polar orbit, descending from the north to the south. A complete Landsat orbit takes about 99 minutes and 14 orbits are completed in a day. The Landsat satellite will pass over the same region every 16 days. There is overlap between paths where near complete overlap at the poles and less near the equator where the overlap is only about 7%. This overlap can help with improved temporal coverage if your area of interest is near the edge of two overlapping Landsat scenes. To find a particular Landsat scene, we use the Worldwide Reference System. It is a gridded system for which each Landsat scene is assigned a path number and a row number. Zooming in for a closer look, each of the black dots represents a Landsat scene center. The more vertical red lines represent the path direction of a Landsat satellite as it orbits the Earth in the descending daytime direction. The satellite passes from the north to the south in a somewhat southwesterly direction. This sun-synchronous orbital path keeps the Landsat satellite passing over any given place on Earth at about 10 to 10.15 a.m. local time. The horizontal red lines represent the rows in ascending order from north to south. For Connecticut, the scene that covers most of the state is located at path 13, row 13. Okay, I think we're back. We lost sound for a little bit. Sorry about that. So again, talking about the Landsat 7 problem, I want to mention uh, the issue. The Landsat 7 sensor experienced an equipment failure on May 31st, 2003. The scanline corrector, which compensates for the forward motion of the satellite, failed. With the scanline corrector functioning, we get a complete coverage of the scene. Whereas when it's not functioning, um, we lose um, a lot of the imagery towards the edge of the scene. There are some gap-filled Landsat 7 products that have been produced, but generally since 2003, we have to deal with the current state of the sensor. So for more detailed information about Landsat, I want to quickly mention a few places where you can go. Um, I would recommend these following websites. 
the USGS Land Missions website, where you will find information regarding the Landsat satellites and missions, including current status and updates to the Landsat satellites. The NASA Landsat Science website, which also provides information about the Landsat mission and similar to the USGS Landsat Missions website. This site has an image viewer, tools, and educational material that can be viewed. And the USGS Landsat Look Viewer, which is a viewer that allows you to quickly view available Landsat imagery. These are all great sites and it really gets in in-depth detail of each of the Landsat missions and sensors. So now I would like to demonstrate where you can get the Landsat data. There are a few options available to you. Starting with the bottom two, the Web Enable Landsat Data or WELD allows you to access 30 meter composite mosaics from the Landsat Terrain Corrected Archive. Basically, they are, they are a set of consistent data that can be used to monitor landscape changes without requiring processing by the user. They are monthly and annual data state sets for specific years, currently starting with 2005 to 2011, but will eventually go back to 1985 at five-year epochs. The Ortho Rectified Landsat Data website is another place you can download post-processed Landsat data. There are four epochs available from the 1970s MSS missions, 1990s thematic mapper, 2000s enhanced thematic mappers, and 2005 enhanced thematic mappers. I have not used either of these websites, but I do know the data is available for there and can be beneficial. Uh, the USGS Earth Explorer and the USGS Glovis websites are where I typically go for data. The USGS Earth Explorer website is one of the primary data acquisition sites you can use to download Landsat data and other data sources. Earth Explorer has a few search options that can be used to find image data. You can enter a search criteria such as an address or place. I use Long Island to locate that position on the Earth's surface. Other options include path and row or a feature search. Once you have your location identified, you can search for data sets. To search for Landsat data, you go into the Landsat archive and select which Landsat satellite you want to search data. In this case, I have selected Landsat 8 OLI TIRS imagery. Clicking the results tab brings up a list of Landsat images that cover my search criteria of Long Island. Depending on the search location, Landsat scenes from multiple paths and rows could be identified. My preference is to acquire Landsat imagery through the USGS Glovid's web page. Glovid stands for the Global Visualization Viewer and is an easy to use visual interface. I was going to try a live demonstration of Glovid's for this webinar, but quite frankly, I don't trust the technology to work. So instead, I have done a screen capture video of the process of going through and selecting a Landsat scene for download from Glovis. I will try to accurately narrate the process as the video plays. When you first go into Glovis, the screen will look something like this. The first thing I will change is the path and row fields to get the area I am interested in. In the case of Connecticut, I want path 13 row 31. Click go to apply the change. As you see, the path 13 row 31 scene is now located in the center of the viewer with the adjacent path row scenes around it. You can also enter a latitude longitude coordinate to get your area of interest if you do not know the path and row. Some other helpful items can be found in the map layers menu. Here are various map layers such as cities or administrative boundaries that can be turned on and off to help find your area of interest. I tend to prefer zooming into just the path row scene I am interested, so I will click the resolution tab and change 1000 meter to 240 meter. Now I am zoomed into just the scene of interest. I will next change the type of Landsat data for which I want to look. This can be done by clicking on the Collection tab and navigating to the Landsat Archive. Here you will get a listing of all the Landsat missions. I want to look for the most recent imagery, so I will click on Landsat 8 OLI. 
the viewer usually will bring up the most recent cloud-free image. To search for additional images, changing the date fields for specific month and year. In this case, I want a fall scene from 2015, so we'll start with October of 2015. Be sure to click Go to apply the change. In the Scene Information box, it provides some basic information such as the actual date of collection and estimated percent cloud cover. I can scroll forward or backward in time by using the next scene or previous scene buttons. Once I find a scene I like, I add it to the list for download. You might have noticed the word downloadable in the upper left corner of the viewer. Typically, all of the more recent Landsat imagery is immediately downloadable as shown. Some of the older Landsat imagery might not be immediately available for download, but can be selected and added to the queue at the USGS for preparation for download. This can take a few hours to a few days depending on the number of jobs they have to process. You will re receive an email and a web link notifying when the scene can be downloaded. Once you have added the scene, click the Send to Cart button. Once you click the scene, Send to Cart button, you are sent to an Earth Explorer web page which lists the pending Landsat scene for download. Here you can see the Landsat scene ID, Landsat satellite collection, and a list of available products. I want to note that at this point you will have to be a registered user of the USGS Earth Explorer site to access the download. Registration is free and easy, and you don't get emails into your in inbox unless you have ordered a scene. So you click on the download icon to go to the next step. The next window allows you to select the product for download. The first four options are really just for viewing purposes. The data you want to download is the level one GeoTIFF data product. I want to quickly tell you what a level one product is. Almost all Landsat data are delivered to the user as a level one product generation system. This means the image you download will have been processed by the USGS into the following. An output format that is a GeoTIFF, resampled using a cubic convolution method, 30 meters or 60 meters depending on the sensor, a universal transverse Mercator projection using the WGS84 datum, and with the image orientation of north being up. There are also a couple of different levels of correction applied to Landsat imagery. These are standard terrain correction, level 1T, which provides radiometric and geometric accuracy by using ground control or elevation data to correct for terrain differences, or systematic correction, level 1G, which just corrects for radiometric and geometric accuracy. So clicking the download button opens a save window and you can save the file to your computer. Now let's get the Landsat image into ArcGIS. The Landsat data is downloaded as a compressed tar.gz format. Don't concern yourself too much with the USGS naming convention, but if you are curious, the LC8 means it is a Landsat 8 image, combined OLI and thermal. 013031 represents the WRS path and row, in this case, path 13, row 31. 2015 is the year of collection. 279 represents the 279th day of the year, 2015, which is October 6, 2015. The LGN00 represents the ground station where the data was received in the archive version number. In this case, it is the ground station USGS Aero Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, in this archive 00. You will need to use a file extractor software to open the file to access the various data layers. My preference is the IZ Arc because that is what I've always used. 7-Zip is also a popular choice. Here are websites you can go to download these extractors if needed. Each Landsat sensor will provide slightly different bands. Here are the extracted files for a Landsat MSS image. 
Here you can see the four reflective bands in the GeoTIFF format, and they are relatively small, only 13 megabytes in size, due to the spatial resolution of 60 meters. The remaining files are informational about the scene and collection process. Here are the extracted files for a Landsat thematic mapper image. Here you can see the six reflective bands and thermal band, band six, in the GeoTIFF format. They are roughly four times the size of an MSS band because of the spatial resolution of 30 meters. Here are the extracted files for a Landsat enhanced thematic mapper image. Here you can see the six reflective bands, thermal bands, band six, and the panchromatic band, band eight, in a GeoTIFF format. The panchromatic band is again roughly four times the size of the multispectral bands because of the spatial resolution of 15 meters. And here are the extracted files for the Landsat Operational Land Imager image. Here you can see the eight reflective bands, thermal bands, bands 10 and 11, and panchromatic band, band 8, in a GeoTIFF format. These files are larger because of the improved radiometric resolution of 16 bits over the 8-bit data of the previous Landsat sensors. As you saw on the previous slide, each Landsat band is delivered in a separate GeoTIFF file. When we use Landsat data, we typically want the individual bands provided in the download to be combined into a single multispectral image. That is, the image we create will be a single GeoTIFF file with multiple bands that can be displayed to produce color images. In ArcGIS, one method we can use is the Composite Bands tool to stack the bands. The Composite Bands tool is found in the Arc Toolbox under Data Management Tools, Raster, Raster Processing. Again, not trusting the technology to work in a live demonstration, I have created a screen capture video showing the process of using the Composite Bands tool in ArcGIS to create a single multispectral GeoTIFF image. I will again narrate the process. As you can see, following the extraction of the tar.gz file, we have each band as an individual GeoTIFF. Since this is a Landsat 8 OLI and TIR combined image, we have 11 GeoTIFF files available. Band 1 is the coastal band, bands 10 and 11 the thermal bands, band 2 is blue, band 3 is green, 4 is red, 5 is near infrared, 6 is a shortwave infrared, 7 is a shortwave infrared, 8 is the 15 meter panchromatic band, and 9 is the cirrus band. The composite bands tools is found under the data management tools, raster, raster processing. Double click to open the tool. Next, we select our input bands. I want just a six band composite image, excluding the Colson cirrus bands, the panchromatic band and the thermal bands. So I select bands two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Add them. Next, I select an output multispectral image. I like to give it a somewhat intuitive name, so I start with L8 for Landsat 8, the path 13 and row 31, the date 06 October 2015, and an MSI-6 bands extension. Make sure you put the .tiff extension for a GeoTIFF file. Click Save and OK to execute the Composite Bands tool. You will see the process working in the lower right corner. It will likely take a few minutes to run. When the Composite Band tools completes processing, the image should automatically display in the ArcGIS view window. We can now manipulate the symbology of this raster data set. Select the layer, right click, and open properties. In the layer properties window, go to the symbology tab. This allows you to assign a Landsat band to one of the three color channels, red, green, and blue. To create a natural color composite, select band three, the red band as red, band two, the green band is green, and band one, the blue band is blue. To create a near-infrared composite or false color composite, use band 4, near-infrared is red, 
three, the red band that's green, and two, the green band as blue. We can zoom in on the image and you can see how the near infrared composite is excellent for distinguishing between vegetated and non-vegetative features. Going back into the properties and symbology, we can look at a 642 band combination, which displays a shortwave infrared band, the near infrared band, and the visible band. Using various portions of the electromagnetic spectrum tends to best highlight all features on the Earth's surface. My personal favorite is a 453 composite which I think best highlights all the features in the manner that I'm used to viewing, where the vegetative features are reddish orange and developed features are blues and water is black. Now that we have combined the individual geotiff bands of the downloaded Landsat image and created a single geotiff multispectral image, what can we do with it? The common use of Landsat imagery is to generate a normalized difference vegetation index, or MDVI. Any image containing a red band and a near-infrared band can be used to derive the MDVI. The MDVI is a simple ratio of the difference of the near-infrared band to the red band over the sum of the near-infrared band to the red band. The result highlights the greenness of an image and shows areas of high vegetation biomass at the per pixel level. The output is a value between negative one and positive one, but this can be stretched to a value of zero to 255, with zero being no vegetation and 255 being complete vegetation. Because the MDVI is a ratio of two bands, it can help compensate for differences in illumination and radiometry between images, and as such, the MDVI can be used to easily identify vegetation and to monitor vegetation health and change. To calculate NDVI in ArcGIS, you can use the NDVI tool in the image analysis window. The image analysis window can be found under the Windows men menu. Click on image analysis to open the window. You will first want to configure the NDVI analysis to make sure the proper bands are selected. To do this, click on the Options button at the top of the Image Analysis window. The MDVI tab should open. MDVI requires the red and near infrared bands. For a typical Landsat thematic mapper or OLI multispectral image, this would be band 3 as red and band 4 as near infrared. Band assignments are based on how the individual bands were stacked using the composite bands tools. In this case, the bands are correct, so click OK. Next, select the image you are interested in calculating the NDVI. Here I have a Landsat 8 OLI image. Once the image is selected, tools become available for use. Click the NDVI button to run the NDVI algorithm. You can see the output. If we toggle on and off the NDVI layer, that forested and vegetated agriculture areas have high NDVI values and appear green while water and built up areas appear yellow to reddish. Given the long historical record of Landsat imagery, it is well suited for use in change detection analysis. The image analysis window provides some basic tools so you can do some simple change detection. This includes the use of swipe to visually compare two images from different times and also an image difference tool. First, we will look at using the image swipe capabilities. As you can see, I have two multispectral Landsat 5 images loaded showing the Interstate 84 corridor going into Massachusetts to the Massachusetts Turnpike in Southbridge, Massachusetts. One from July of 2001 and a second from July of 2011. The band combination for both images are displayed as 4, 3, and 2, a near-infrared false color composite. 
In the image analysis window, I select one of the images and click on the swipe layer button to activate the feature. To use the swipe, I simply click and hold the mouse button as I drag the mouse from side to side. You can also change the direction of the swipe by moving the mouse up and down. Aside from some clouds in both the 2001 and 2011 images, some changes that are noticeable include some changes in agricultural field vegetative cover, some clearing of the forest for some future development, but also the track of the tornado that struck the area on June 1st, 2011. We can also quantify the difference between image layers by using the difference tool on specific bands. We want to be certain we are comparing the same band from each date. For this example, I'm using only band 4, the near red band, from the 2001 and 2011 Landsat 5 images. To use the tool, select the two band 4 images in the image analysis window. The tool becomes active. Select the difference tool to apply the image difference algorithm to the two images. The output is a grayscale image with values ranging from, in this case, 2000, or 210 to negative 255. A value near zero means there is no reflective difference between the two dates. The more change between the two dates, the further from zero the values become. We can change the symbology on, on the difference layer for more clarity. Right-click the difference image and go to Properties. I will change the color ramp to a diverging color ramp to better highlight the changes. Now we should be able to better see the changes by using this color ramp. In this case, the yellows and light greens are areas of no change. The darker greens are more highly reflective in band for the 2001 image. Basically, they were vegetated in the 2001 and not in 2011. And the darker browns are more highly reflective than band for the 2011, basically not vegetated in 2001, but vegetated in 2011. When studying change, it is not only important to think about what bands to compare, such as using band 4 to identify areas that have changed from vegetation to not vegetation, but also the time of year and the area of study. Of course, there are many other analysis options available in ArcGIS, but those will have to wait for another webinar. To close, I would like to mention the benefits of Landsat data. Landsat provides a repetitive and synoptic view of the Earth, allowing researchers and managers the ability to study wide geographic areas over a lengthy temporal period. The spatial coverage allows for easy use where you don't have to worry as much about managing many tiles of data collected over a period of several days. The temporal coverage of every 16 days allows for easy monitoring of landscape changes. With both Landsat and 7 and 8, repeat coverage is every 8 days, although clouds can be an issue. In addition, there is over a 40-year archive of global imagery available. No other moderate or high-resolution sensor can claim that distinction. The spectral resolution allows us to view beyond the visible and near-infrared portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is common with other sensors providing us with additional information. And best of all, all Landsat data is downloadable for free, giving us total access to all of the processed imagery since Landsat 1 in 1972. Well, I hope we have been successful in providing you with an understanding of the Landsat mission and sensors, how to get the data, and how to get it into ArcGIS and ready for use. We hope you are eager to get online Check out the Landsat archive and download some data of your own and start viewing it and using it for whatever purpose you might have. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. And now we would be happy to take a few questions. Are you with me, Dan? I am. Okay. 
Uh, <clears throat> since I don't see any questions coming in, I, I might add that uh, in future uh, webinars, we'll talk more about what we can do with uh, Landsat images, such as enhancing them, do some contrast enhancement, uh, the extraction of spectral signatures for the purpose of doing land cover classification, and then looking specifically maybe at urban change, uh, looking at drought, temperature, the NDVI, which we've already done. So we do have in mind some advanced uh, applications and processes for uh, Landsat data within an ArcGIS environment. Right. Um... Do we have a question? Will the presentation be available as a PDF? Yes. Yeah, we can do that. We can make that available. Uh, that'll be on the website, clear.ucon.edu, along with the recording of the webinar. Mina Kim asked the question, have you used it for wetlands mapping? Uh, that's actually how I got started in all this. Uh, back in the, well, I don't say when, but <laughs> using uh, uh, imagery from the 70s, 80s for inland wetlands uh, mapping in, in Connecticut. Uh, the problem there is the resolution uh, is at best going to get you maybe to the quarter acre, acre size uh, minimum mapping unit. Uh, so we don't have necessarily the spatial detail that we do with, uh, with high resolution imagery, but we have the chronology going back into the 70s. Uh, so if you're you're happy with acre or maybe slightly coarser minimum mapping unit is fine, and we have the choice of multiple seasons. For inland wetlands in Connecticut, it would be probably spring palustrine wetlands, uh, springtime leaf off after snow melt but before bud break. Um, for coastal wetlands, we'd be interested in looking at the different salt marsh grasses, so probably a July, August, uh, maybe even September uh, time frame. So what would you say would be the accuracy of, of that for wetland mapping, Dan? Well, it depends on what you want to call accuracy. In Connecticut, wetlands are, of course, defined legally based on soil type, poorly drained, very, very poorly drained, alluvial and floodplain. And some of those parameters we're not going to extract or identify directly from Landsat data. But we can get things like vegetation type. So it depends on what you're trying to classify in terms of the wetlands. Just presence absence uh, for wetlands that have maybe a, a minimum size of two to three acres, uh, probably around 90% or higher at the right time of the year. Again, March, April, maybe into early May. All right, um, we have a question. Any application for water quality in Long Island? Is that Long Island sound or I would assume? So, Dan, I wonder. any thoughts? Well, <laughs> I've not done a lot directly except for the use of uh, Landsat for, as you indicated earlier on, remote bathymetry in Fishers Island, Long Island Sound. So in the 80s, we used uh, contemporaneous measurements of depth, so we did soundings, and modeled those against the uh, brightness values of Landsat to come up with a predictive model that uh, estimated depth of water in relatively shallow water, clear water situations. It's not like in the Bahamas where one can you know, see many meters down because of the clarity of the water. So around here, we're kind of restricted by uh, suspended sediments or organic material. But it was reasonably accurate, as you showed in the slide, uh, in getting near uh, shore shallow depths. Yeah, and I've also seen examples of using Landsat to look at algal blooms. Um, if there's an oil spill, we can sometimes see the sheen of the oil on the surface of the water. So yeah, there, there are some applications that Landsat uh, could be used. Uh, another area in water, James and I and, and others have used uh, Landsat data to estimate water clarity, uh, specifically secchi distransparency of lakes and ponds in Connecticut. And this has been done quite a bit in the Great Lakes states for many, many years. So we have yet to operationalize what we did experimentally a few years ago, but there's hope to do that with some future research. All right, Dan, is there any potential for using Landsat data to model for solar energy production? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, and if you're working with um, ArcGIS, you can combine the solar radiation tools, which enable you to model over a year or a season or any point in time or a period of time that you'd like 
the amount of incident radiation uh, on a, a, a digital elevation model. So we have to have a quality DEM to begin with, maybe from NED, the National Elevation Data Set, or the uh, the Connecticut LIDAR available through CLEAR or CTECO, excuse me. And then so in conjunction with the satellite data, we could scan or screen for different kinds of conditions like is it forested or not forested? Um, do we want to clear the land or not? Uh, are we in, in proximity to an urban area? So in combination, the remote sensing data along with elevation data and solar radiation models, we can get some pretty good idea of where we might want to have our solar panels or not. Okay, we have, we'll answer two more questions here. Um, do you often have to rectify spatial or radiometric resolutions between the different missions? Is there yeah, a that's, a good, that's a good question. James, you could probably answer this one as well, too. Uh, Especially early on with Landsat 4 and 5, the geometric correction was not as rigorous as it is as it's been in Landsat 7 and 8. So yeah, you might get uh, d data delivered from USGS that are geometrically correct, but they may not uh, align that well with some of the more recent corrections. So yeah, we've had to post-process some of those earlier Landsat, MSS, TM, ETM data, especially the uh, 4 and 5 and 1, 2, and 3, to align with more recent data. And the last question, any advice on using Landsat for mapping temperature differences with a relatively small area, specifically trying to look at urban heat island effects? Yeah, we I've done this, and some students have done this in, in projects. One that I like to use is uh, the casinos in southeast Connecticut, uh, examining the the heat conditions pre-development and then post-development. So looking at Landsat data from the 80s, early 90s, uh, the thermal data from those, and then showing how things have changed through time uh, to the current you know, extent of the, the pavement and the impervious surfaces. So yeah, there's been quite a bit of work done on urban, urban heat island effects in uh, doing that with Landsat thermal data. All right, uh, great. Okay, uh, well this is Dave again. I wanted to just thank James and Dan for uh, what I thought was a great webinar. Hope you all um, got something out of it and you can, you're welcome to follow up with James and Dan if you have further questions on Landsat data and uh, stay tuned for more information about uh, further CLEAR webinars. Thanks very much. Thank you.